Excellent! What's up guys, welcome to Probing Paul, episode number 13. This is my Baker's Dozen episode. This is my Q&A segment, I do it every month, and I answer the uh, questions that you guys ask in the comment section, which many of you, many of you have done uh, from last month, which was episode number 12, and we can see all the times I've done this segment in the past. I've been doing this for like over a year now, that's crazy. Uh, but let's actually just dive right into it with the first question from Mr. Shaw. I'm looking at a new $200 GPU. Should I get a GTX 1060 3 gig or an RX 480 4 gig? That's a very good question and one that I'm sure lots of people have since $200 is a pretty uh, popular price to pay for a GPU. Um, at least when you're looking at a slightly more budget or more towards the budget end rig if you're not going to be spending three or four hundred bucks. Um, but I do want to point something out to you guys. This is an article. It's linked in the description. We talked about it on the live show on Tuesday. Uh, AMD is working on some refreshes of their current GPUs, and according to this rumor article on WCCF Tech, so a whole barrel of salt to go along with this, but uh, they have an RX 4 580 and an RX 570. Uh, both are rebrands of the Polaris GPUs that the 480, 470, and 460 are based on. And they're saying it's been postponed until April 18th. In this article so if that is truly the case and if the article uh, is true at all then uh, the 580 and 570 might be providing uh, higher clocked chips and they also might be dropping the price of an 8 gig 580 which would be equivalent to an 8 gig 480 just a little bit faster down to $200 and that might be about a month away so again all this is rumors, so it's hard to bank on it too much, but you might consider hanging out for a month or so, because right now you got to pay about 250 bucks for a GTX 1060 6 gig, and you got to pay 230 to 250 for an RX 480 8 gig. I would definitely recommend getting the larger memory capacity if that's something that's uh, that you can afford, if you can fit it in the budget. So I'd look for a cheap RX 480 8 gig right now, or uh, hang out for a month or so, see if AMD does release those rebrands, and then maybe you'll have some better options for you. You might even see uh, NVIDIA respond with the price drop on the 1060, so that then, then you'd have uh, an option right there. Uh, if you're just trying to choose between AMD and NVIDIA, uh, consider your monitor. If you're ever thinking about doing G-Sync or FreeSync, uh, you might lean towards AMD at that lower end of the budget because the monitors you can get with FreeSync tend to be a lot less expensive. Thank you for the question, though. Next question. From Terranomics, Terranomics, uh, three weeks ago. Are there still going to be lower-end Zen CPUs? And the answer here would be yes. And a lot of you guys might be already familiar with this, but let's take a look at it re real quick. Uh, this just dropped a couple days ago. AMD has released information about the Ryzen 5 CPUs. They should be available for sale April 11th, so just under a month away. It's going to be available for $169, so there's the whole product stack right there. 1400, 1500X, 1600X, and 1600X. These are all still based on the same dies as the Ryzen 7, so they're gonna have cores disabled. But we're to told they're still gonna be using both CCX units. So there's still a lot of questions as far as uh, uh, performance goes, and particularly gaming performance and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, yes. And uh, you have quad cores as well as six cores with SMT multi-threading. Uh, to give you 8 threads or 12 threads uh, for pretty reasonable prices. So um, I feel like I can at this point without having tested or put my hands on these CPUs at all say that these will probably be pretty good options for uh, multi-use computing. Um, we're definitely going to be hitting these pretty hard with the gaming benchmarks because that was one of the uh, shortcomings in CPU limited situ situations with the Ryzen 7 uh, CPUs. And since these are definitely geared more towards uh, the lower budget CPU, uh, lower budget systems that gamers might be more interested in, the gaming performance, particularly at lower resolutions where you can become more CPU bound, is going to be a pretty important question. So, yes. Yes is the answer to your question. And uh, give us a few weeks until hopefully we can give you guys some reviews on those and talk about the performance. Next question from Yami Frank C. Paul, what difference does a chipset make? Also a good question. Um, if you're not familiar with chipsets and how they work and what they do, there's actually many different answers to this question. It's not just the simple, here is exactly what they do. I mean, the chipset uh, gives you a bunch of ad additional input and outputs. Uh, so you can have what's called the PCH, the peripheral controller hub, that's part of the chipset that can control stuff like SATA ports and that kind of thing. On the Intel side, your chipset will determine whether or not you have unlocked uh, overclocking support or overclocking support for unlocked K SKU processors. So if you have a 7700K, for example, CPU, then you've got to have a Z170 or a Z270 chipset 
motherboard in order to overclock it. The lower end chipsets on Intel don't allow for overclocking. Uh, AMD, of course, has a bunch of, uh, of, of things as well. So here's a quick chart of that if you want to check it out. And I know this looks a little complex, so I'm not going to go through all of it right now. Suffice to say, the high-end chipsets are generally going to be in more expensive motherboards and have the vast array of features, or basically all the features that are available for the platform. So like with X370 on the AMD side, you are able to split your PCIe lanes for graphics cards to 1x16 and 2x8, which will give you support for SLI or Crossfire two-way. Uh, also for USB, um, you might get more USB 3.1 ports, Gen 2, USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports, USB 2.0 ports. You can see the number of those all the way down the line. The number of SATA and NVMe uh, devices that can be attached. Uh, the number of SATA Express devices that can be attached. Those are stupid, so don't worry about those. Uh, PCI Express, SATA RAID, all that kind of stuff. So uh, pay attention to those charts. Uh, look at your budget and what your CPU is supposed to do and what you want to do with your computer. By and large, you can get away with the higher end chipsets. Um, if you start getting into the more the budget options is where you start to really kind of see features disappear and you might not get something that you might want, like say you want support for RAID 10 or something like that. Again though, there's lots of variances, so there's no quick and easy answer to this. But if you do want some additional viewing material, uh, I'll post a link in the comment for my should you get a budget chipset motherboard, which is, gosh, a couple years old now, but still very relevant. I even had, wow, look, that's like my before I built my set out and my tables and everything. Look how ghetto it looks. It's horrible. Anyway, uh, hopefully that should help you out, though. Next question from Mecragone. Mecragone? Do you still use third-party antivirus or anti-malware software, and why or why not? Uh, I, I'm about, I was about to say no, I don't. My initial response was going to be no, I don't, and the reason why not would be because I've been using the internet for quite a few years now, since since the internet became something that the public had access to, since since AOL, AOL days, let's put it that way. Um, and I've just gotten used to when browsing, you know, the shady stuff is often very evident. You know, when you click on something and you get a big pop-up that like starts giving you an alert that like, you have a virus and you have to click here and go here to fix it or whatever. Like, I know that's BS and I'm just gonna like close out that window or, you know, you know that kind of thing. And that usually doesn't happen because usually I don't stray into the shadier parts of the internet. Um, but you know, you can't, that can happen. You can click an errant link or something like that. So when I thought about this again, I was like, actually, Anti-malware for sure, and malware bytes is far and away my favorite for that. Uh, the, the basic version is free. Uh, it's constantly updated. It's really good at getting in there and rooting out stuff that might have uh, infected your system, particularly when it comes to malware. So I usually, when I have a new system, don't have any antivirus stuff installed. I'll use the system for a while. If something happens that seems fishy to me, then I'll usually get malware bytes. Uh, if I'm really uh, suspicious, I'll boot into safe mode and run malware bytes there. And that can usually get rid of most stuff that's not like too, too terrible as far as having infected your system. But yeah, uh, that should hopefully answer your question. Next question from Thomas S. What are some tips for people getting into custom water cooling? Funny you should have asked this question a few weeks ago because my most recent video posted just a was that yesterday, uh, is about Arctic Panther, my water-cooled system that I built in 2015, uh, which used to be back here behind me. It has been relocated to uh, the computer room, and I have been using the crap out of it, um, but I also neglected to do the proper service and maintenance on it. Um, so that would be my biggest tip right now for people getting into custom water cooling is uh, either don't put any additives or opaque fluid or anything like that into your liquid itself if you want something that's gonna run for a long time and not require more maintenance or if you do go that route which I understand there's there's definitely some aesthetic appeal in like the opaque fluid and that kind of thing and that's why I did it and I knew I knew I knew when I was doing it that adding that stuff to it was going to potentially lead to um, I don't say problems, but just it, it, it's going to require more maintenance down the line. I neglected to do that. You should uh, definitely flush your, your loop every six months regardless, and especially if you're using something like opaque fluid. Uh, beyond that, I would just say generally speaking with water cooling, with custom water cooling, uh, don't do it if you're on a strict budget. Your money will much be much better spent getting higher-end hardware. Um, like don't water cool a GTX 1060, for example. 
just sell it and get a GTX 1070 or 1080. You'll, you'll get more performance that way. Uh, also, I only typically recommend water cooling <clears throat> if you've built a system that's really high end, that's kind of reaching towards the bleeding edge of performance, and the only way you can get better performance is by water cooling it and overclocking it more or something like that. It can also be a great option if you want something that's really quiet, because if you have a lot of radiators and slow moving fans, and you have, uh, 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 the, if your fin density is low so that the, the air can flow through uh, can flow through easily then you can end up with a very cool running and very quiet system but uh, yeah watch that maintenance and uh, if you want more on that if you give it, if you didn't check it out already uh, I will also post a link to this video uh, restoring Arctic Panther part of the epic Arctic Panther playlist you guys should check that out it's been it's been good so far okay next question from a I'm going to call you Crafts Gaming because your actual username is just some letters and numbers. Paul, at what age did you start building computers and what happened to your first computer? So I guess I would say 14, um, although that wouldn't be strictly speaking building a computer. Uh, when I was about 13 or 14, I remember my dad and I uh, went and got a, a Hewlett Packard 486DX based computer, you know, it was one of those desktop ones, beige box with the CRT monitor on top and everything. Uh, and that was when I was 14, and then after using it for a while, I did a RAM upgrade on it, and that was a, that was my, my first dipping of my toe into the um, actually building your own computer thing. Uh, it wasn't until I was, I think, 16 that I actually went to Fry's and bought a barebone system and then got the rest of the pieces to, like, install everything and built what was my own computer that was just mine, and I sort of, I guess I sort of put it all together myself, even though it was a barebone system from Fry's. Um, Although, again, we had a Commodore 64. Uh, that doesn't really count quite as much for, for building computers. Uh, what happens in my first computer, it's probably got recycled at some point. Um, again, that was that 486, 486DX system, and it's just, it was a really long time ago, and I'm not really sure what happened to it. At this point, yeah, if I could go back, I probably might have kept at least that first one for just for nostalgia's sake, um, but, but I didn't, so... So there it is. But uh, thank you for your question, Crafts Gaming. And next is Juna Knutinen. Knu Juna Knutinen. Juna How do you whitelist channels? I'm asking because a friend of mine wants to know. Well, your friend is a very nice person if they're interested in whitelisting. And uh, let, me, let me walk you guys through it real quick if you're interested. And this is particularly for Adblock. So I've actually already set it up on this. Let me bring it down so you can see. I got the little green thumb mark right there for Adblock. So the way you do this uh, is you gotta go into Adblock, and if you just open up Adblock, it'll it'll give you op options for enabling or disabling Adblock on a specific page or on a domain. But you don't wanna have to go and do that for every single YouTube video, and if you don't wanna at whitelist the entire YouTube website, which I'm guessing a lot of you probably don't, then yeah, you have to do this. Basically, you gotta go into the settings. Uh, there's an extra checkbox there in the settings menu uh, to specifically whitelist individual YouTube channels. This is with standard adblock, by the way. So just go ahead and click that, uh, reset or restart your browser, and then you should be able to pull that back up. Go in there, whitelist the YouTube channel, and then uh, any page that is associated with that YouTube channel, whether it be the channel page, uh, like a watch page or the channel page or, or anything like that, uh, you, you'll still see the ads, and that means I will still get uh, a little bit of money from you watching those ads, and, and I'm very grateful to you guys for that. Of course, if you just want to run Adblock, I, like, I really don't mind that either, because I understand how intrusive and annoying ads can be at times. But yeah, that's how you whitelist. At least with Adblock. Marmar040. Uh, this is the last question, and one that was clearly quite popular with all the thumbs-ups it got in the last video. Do you look at your own poop before flushing it down? Uh, of course I do. It is a natural human instinct to look at your own poop before or like after you've done it and it's it's built in because you look at it because if it's like a strange color or something like that or it looks really weird then you know something's wrong like you got something with your intestines maybe is, is tied or, uh, or you've been eating the wrong food or perhaps you should stop drinking until you pass out every single night. That might be something to take into consideration. So uh, Marmar, yes, to answer your question very specifically. I do. But guys, that's all for this episode of Probing Paul. Thank you so much for probing me. Uh, and of course, if you guys want to ask me questions to be answered next month, please leave those down in the comments section down below. While you're at it, hit the thumbs up button. And that's all. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.